a master's degree in wildlife biology. And that got him into the field a lot. And he knows a lot about wildlife and particularly has a uh, strong knowledge. And I'm almost a freakish knowledge about birds, uh, which I got to see firsthand in Botswana. But uh, like some of our recent guest presenters, I first met David out in the field doing something related to photography. My wife and I were up staying at um, the Arctic Getaway Bed and Breakfast in Wiseman, and he was there with clients. And we have connected over the years with a joint passion in the Brooks Range and Arctic of Alaska, and then most recently connected on a trip to Botswana. So I'd like to introduce David and I look forward to him guiding us through a journey to Botswana tonight. On to you, David. Thanks so much, uh, Carl. It was, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's always funny how photographers come together. Um, I think Carl and I met once uh, in person, uh, but we've been connected for social media for like a decade. And uh, finally we got together and um, co-led this trip to uh, Botswana um, that we just finished up. Um, oh, well, we were there just a little more than a month ago. Um, so yeah, it's been, a, it was a, pretty crazy trip in terms of all sorts of things but we also hit right in the middle of the omicron eruption which was well that was fun um actually it ended up being great we had a, we had a good time there was almost no other tourists in the whole country of botswana and south africa so it ended up working out well anyway um i'm gonna jump right in to the talk here let me share my screen compress some of this stuff and here we go um so yeah, as uh, Carl said, so the journey to Botswana, I've led uh, three trips to Botswana over the last six years. Um, and it's become one of my very favorite places to photograph. Um, anybody who's a wildlife photographer has probably seen images come out of this part of the world. It is a truly wonderful place. Um, but first, I briefly want to, Carl did a great introduction. I won't bemoan introducing myself too much, but this is me. Um, I'm a professional photographer uh, and workshop leader. Uh, I'm based, you know, I kind of split my time these days between Fairbanks and Alaska and Colorado. Um, but, uh, but Fairbanks, I still consider home. Um, and that was home for, and is home for the past 23 years. Um, as Carl mentioned, I've I got both undergraduate and master's degrees in wildlife biology. Birds were my specialty. Um, for many years, I worked at uh, the Alaska Bird Observatory and at uh, consulting jobs and contracting for government agencies and things like that, studying species like this Arctic warbler. Um, and rusty blackbirds were another target species of mine over the years. Um, but eventually I realized I was enjoying writing and photography and leading trips. Uh, wilderness trips particularly was where I got started leading trips up in the Brooks Range. Um, and then uh, I kind of realized I was making as much money doing photography as I was doing my real job. So. I quit the real job um, and it timed out well that way and moved into leading a lot of wilderness trips um, and working on assignment for different magazines, um, different uh, nonprofits, working on conservation related uh, photography projects. Um, and that led me to what I do now, uh, which is um, uh, working on assignment a certain amount, but I'd say the bulk of my business now comes from leading photography workshops and tours, uh, like trips where Carl and I met up to the Brooks Range. Um, so Aurora trips, I'll be heading back north uh, in March to lead a couple of trips up to this part of the world. Um, and looking forward to getting back and seeing some Northern lights. Um, so anyway, that's enough about me. Let's dive into the cool stuff of Botswana. Um, so just to kind of get your orientation in case you're not too familiar with African geography. Um, so Botswana is this country, I hope you can see my cursor, um, is right here on just north of South Africa and east of um, Namibia. Um, and the area that we're going to concentrate our journey through is pretty much this northern section of Botswana. This is the Okavango Delta. Uh, it's famous for wildlife um, and also because it's an inland delta. It doesn't, uh, the Okavango River never reaches the sea. It just dries out as it hits the Kalahari Desert, which is where all of this central part of Botswana is. Um, so this is the journey we're going to take. We're going to start in Kasani, which is in this far northeastern corner of Botswana. We're gonna spend some time along the Chobe River, 
Then we're going to drive down to the arid regions of southern Chobe National Park, Sibuti. We're going to drive through the Mababe Depression and on into the, the lower Okavango Delta near the village of Kauai, then deeper into the Okavango in, Mar in the Marimi Preserve, wrapping up our trip in Maun, which is um, sort of a regional hub, but hardly a big town. Botswana has one major city, Gaborone, and it's in the opposite side of the country uh, from this. So, and it has a relatively low population in comparison to the amount of space it has. And as a result, there's a ton of wildlife. Um, and they've done a very good job of creating protected areas. Um, there are some conservation issues, just like there are everywhere. Uh, but overall, I'd say Botswana has done an exceptional job of conservation. Um, a little bit more to get your bearing. So though Botswana is fairly equatorial, it does have strong seasonality. Um, so mid-December to March is, is the green season, the rainy season. Um, it's probably the, the hardest time to visit logistically. As Carl will agree, I'm sure, most of the roads that you drive on safari in Botswana are two-track sand and mud tracks. And if it gets too wet, they become impassable. Um, April to May is the flood season. So that's when the water out of Angola finally reaches the Okavango Delta and floods into the Delta. Um, that can be good for wildlife in that it forces all the critters up onto islands in this big marsh, shallow marshland of the Okavango Delta, but it makes transportation hard uh, because there's just not a lot of roads that are um, open. June to August is dry and cool. That's typically the, the big tourist season. Um, and, uh, but it has some drawbacks as a photographer because you tend to have clear blue skies and that's it. September and October are dry and also very, very hot. My first trip to Botswana was in October. Um, I wouldn't really recommend that time of year because it is so blistering hot. Um, that said, the photography can be great because it's the end of the dry season, the rains haven't arrived yet, the animals are really attracted to the few water holes and the river fronts that are out there. Um, and so finding critters is really easy, um, which can be a positive, but in terms of being out there, um, it is, oh boy, it's hot. Um, November to early December is how where I've been leading trips most recently, particularly the end of November into early December. It's starting to get a little cooler, still pretty darn warm. This last trip um, was quite warm. Um, and but my previous two trips in that time period have been a little more in the, you know, pretty warm during the day, but cooling off nicely and, and never too miserably hot. Um, it's kind of the early green season. I really like it because um, the, the weather's starting to come in. And so you get cloudy days, which sort of control some of that um, hot light of midday, which is good for photography. Um, but what I really like about it is cloudscapes. Um, other times of the year, you don't get these kinds of beautiful cloudscapes that come through during the early part of the green season. Um, and it can be really beautiful to have these constantly shifting skies um, rather than just clear blue, dry bluebird days. Um, all right, so we're going to start our journey on the Chobe River. So, um, so just when we start our safaris, we I have the group meet in Johannesburg. We spend a night there, and then we hop on a plane and fly up to Kasane, which is in the northern end of Botswana. Um, and we spend a couple of nights, the first few nights of the trip, on the Chobe River and the Chobe River front um, areas. And within usually an hour of arriving at the Kasane airport, this is where we find ourselves. Um, Kasane is a small village, pretty much tourist driven, right on the Chobe River. Um, and it's pretty much a baptism of African wildlife fire in that within an hour of getting off the plains, we're getting onto a small boat and heading out to look at things like crocodiles, uh, cruising that are sub, uh, basking on the, on the riverfront. Um, getting right up close and personal with herds of elephants. Um, and it can be a very wild way to realize that, oh my God, I've gone from this huge metropolitan city of Johannesburg into the African bush. And it's a super great experience to also just have people dive into wildlife photography. Uh, this was a, uh, a crocodile we that grabbed a dung beetle that was walking next to it on the, uh, on the shore of the, uh, of the Chobe during our most recent trip. Um, elephants coming down to drink are quite common, as particularly in the dry season. As the wet season comes on, there's more natural water holes out into the bush, and so the elephants move away from the river. 
Um, but if you catch it during the early part of the wet season or the dry season, there's lots of elephants along the shore. In abundant birds, this is an African darter, African fish eagle, uh, a lot of other things too that you don't always expect. This is a water monitor. Uh, this guy was about five feet long or so, but dove into the, uh, came down out of the woods, dropped into the river just a, a few feet away from us. A lot of other animals too, um, because it's the only year round water source for many miles in this part of Africa. Uh, you know, big herds of zebras come in. This is a wintering area, uh, well, or summering area, I'm not sure how you'd look at it. Um, there's a, a lot of zebras that seasonally spend time along the Chobe River. Um, as I mentioned, big herds of elephants. This was a, a great interaction during the last trip. These two young bulls were uh, having a little wrestling match and they were a great fun to watch for about 10 or 15 minutes as they were, as they were tussling on uh, right in the beautiful evening light. Giraffes are abundant in this area. You, we've seen you know, uh, groups of 15, 20 giraffes all standing around together at once. Uh, and they're always, uh, you know you're in Africa when you're watching giraffes, that's for sure. More zebras. And also primates. Um, along the, we do see baboons and uh, vervet monkeys further into the trip, but along the Chobe, they are particularly abundant. And you see, troops of 50, 60, even more um, moving along in the riverfront. And so it's one of the, it's probably the best opportunity we get on this particular safari itinerary to photograph baboons. Um, and so big troops of them with young, uh, quite neat baby baboons hanging out. Um, and it's always just such a, a pleasure and, and they're such fun to see and they are constantly at play. Um, this is a vervet monkey with a baby that we encountered on the most recent trip. Um, they're often right around where we stop and take breaks for morning tea uh, when we're out on game drives. Uh, this particular monkey actually stole a muffin out of one of our vehicles before we got a chance to scare her off. Um, and then she ate the muffin and then proceeded to let her young hang off of her and nurse. Looks a little painful to me. Another great part about the early part of the green season is it also coincides with the time when most of the animals are dropping their young. And so species like the impala, which are by far the most common animals we see on safari in Botswana, um, there can be just many, many uh, young impala. They come together in these nursery herds where there'll be 40, 50, 60 yearling impala, all just you know a month to a few weeks old or less, um, hanging out with a couple of adults. And, uh, and so you can get you know, big groups of them hanging out together. And it's really fun to see and see how their behaviors are. And uh, they're always so curious about the vehicles and, and uh, they're, it's, a, it's a fun thing. And just about every other species is also having their young right around this time. So uh, if you wanna see baby animals, then late November, early December is a great time of year to visit Botswana. On two of my three trips to Botswana, um, I haven't encountered lions along the Chobe River, but this most recent trip, we had a great morning uh, with a, a couple of lionesses and I believe four cubs. Um, and the cubs were, they must have had a successful night's hunt because they were full of energy and uh, looked well fed and were just tussling and wrestling with one another in the sand dunes above the Chobe. Um, and so it was just, a, we had a great morning watching these guys. Um, the, I think we were having a better morning than this lioness who just couldn't keep her cubs from trying to tackle her as she was uh, wandering, trying to head back into the woods to, uh, to find a place to nap for the day. Um, but just beautiful morning light and catching that morning light is so important on safari. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a little bit. Um, so as we move south, we go through one of the only stretches of pavement that we encounter on the entire journey. Um, and uh, occasionally there's roadkill, just like everywhere. But on this particular case, this roadkill jackal had brought in a tawny eagle, uh, which allowed us pretty good photo opportunities. So, um, you know, take advantage of it when you can get it. So I just want to take a little interlude here before we move on to our next stop of our journey and talk since we're photographers, I wanted to briefly talk about the challenge of challenging light. So these equatorial areas in Botswana, 
the light gets really hot really fast. And I don't just mean hot in terms of heat, I mean hot in terms of brightness. And um, it, it can be a, a real difficulty in terms of photography because you don't want to stop shooting. You're in Botswana. It's not like you can pick and choose your moments. Um, but coping with that challenging light can be really tricky. Um, and, you know, you get two beautiful hours in the morning and you get two beautiful hours in the evening, if you're lucky. Um, and then the rest of the day can be a quite challenging situation. So I often rely on black and white conversions. Um, I think it, it works very effectively in these sort of bright conditions and high contrast areas. This is a Cape Buffalo. Um, photographed in really bright light conditions. You can see its shadow is just directly under it. So the sun was practically right overhead. Um, same kind of situation here with this herd of wildebeest. Um, black and white conversions seem to deal with that fairly effectively um, and still be able to get decent images. Um, these two bull elephants, this is um, our next stop of our journey is in Savuti, a dry area. And we encountered these two on our last journey. Um, and it was blistering hot, both temperature and light wise, um, when we stopped to check out these elephants. And I knew with the bright conditions, it wasn't going to make a good color shot. You know, there's nothing, you, you can't fix bad light in Photoshop. Um, and so you cope with it, you do with what you can, in which case black and white conversions are an effective way to make that happen. Um, big herds of Cape Buffalo, same bright light conditions, highly contrast, works fairly effectively in black and white. Um, Two other examples with a, a leopard and another elephant. Um, and more wildebeest. Two, uh, you know, just going low, uh, staying with a high contrast, but adding a little bit of color sepia tone images like this can be uh, quite effective ways to deal with a difficult light. Um, I, you know, I kind of like the story that those kind of those kind of things tell. You know, heat, bright sun, that's part of these animals' lives. And I think if we fail to tell that part of the story, uh, then we're doing the evolution and the uh, life histories of these animals a disservice. Um, this is actually one of my favorite images from the most recent trip. Um, we, it was oh, right in the middle of one of the hottest days we had, and we saw this there was actually a couple of other elephants here too, but this one had taken shelter under the one tree that offered any shade for any distance around. Um, and I think it just tells us a lot about the life of these animals in this environment. Um, even though the light's absolute crap, it, in this case, it works as a benefit to telling the story that we were working for. Uh, you can also go high key and go just, you know, blow out your backgrounds, make it look like a cutout. Uh, that can be a pretty effective way to deal with these bright light conditions, um, as I did with the giraffe there and then this image of a tawny eagle. All right, um, so on to Savuti. Uh, Savuti is the southern part of Chobe National Park. It's a pretty arid, or not pretty arid, it's very arid. Uh, it's very much similar to the Kalahari uh, Desert in terms of its vegetation. Um, and there's a number of species of wildlife in this area that don't occur elsewhere in, um, in Chobe or elsewhere on the trip. Um, and that includes lions. They're one of the big draws of, of Sibuti is it's home to two rather large prides of lions. Um, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, but there's also a fair amount of open country in this part and some hills, as you can see in the background there which make things a little more topographically interesting. Uh, but species like these sesebi, which are the world's fastest antelope, um, are found out in the big open savanna areas um, that are in the Savuti region of Chobe. Uh, again, these are uh, uh, another reason why I love the early part of the rainy season is these cloudscapes. You just don't get that other times of year. So storm clouds moving in over a, a herd of sesebi. Um, Bad-eared foxes. It's basically the only place on the trip where you're at all likely to encounter them. They are darn hard to get close to. Um, they're quite shy um, and they're endangered, so they're really strict about not being allowed to approach them too closely. Um, but they, uh, when you get to see them, it's pretty neat. Um, I'm afraid this is one of the best photos I've managed of these guys. This is a steambuck, um, one of the very small species of antelope. They're about the size of a medium-sized dog, um, and they are, uh, I think they're rather adorable. Uh, I love their eyelashes. This is a female, uh, but again, they're a, an arid uh, country species, so they're not common elsewhere during the trip. 
Uh, there's also several uh, stands of um, baobab trees, which are some of the world's oldest and longest lived trees. Um, they're distinctive, interesting. You always know a baobab when you see one because they look like they're kind of, you know, tipped upside down or something. They have this teardrop shape to them um, and they can be quite ancient. Some of the trees in this stand were over 800 years old uh, and they're likely much older than that. Uh, elephants take a toll on baobabs. They come up and scratch on them and then also eat the bark for the fiber um, and it can actually kill the baobab trees. And so they tend to, the baobabs tend to grow almost exclusively in these rocky habitats like this. Um, and that's because the, uh, the um, elephants don't like to um, walk on the rocks. Um, oop. And this is a uh, um, one of the big draws for, like I said, there are two large lion prides in the Sibuti area. Um, and uh, it is easy to get up close with lions in the Sibuti area. This was a, a nice big male, one of the leaders of the North Pride um, about six years ago. I think he has since passed on. A couple of lionesses after a successful hunt. One of the advantages, some of these images here were taken during October and, and one of the advantages of that, of that time of year, despite the heat, is the fact there's just no water. And so they, a couple of artificial water holes have been constructed in the Sibuti area and you could just go hang out at the water holes in the evenings and just about everything comes in. That's where I photographed this lioness. On our most recent trip, we encountered um, this lioness with her three very young, very adorable cubs. Um, it, these are members of the Marsh Pride, which is close to 40 animals strong, um, one of the biggest prides in Botswana. Um, and we got to spend quite a bit of time with different members of them over the course of the, the three full, two full days and two and a half days that we had in the Sibuti area. Um, we spent a lovely morning with this lioness and her cubs. Um, which was a highlight of the trip for me and I think most of the people who were on it. She stopped at one point to uh, um, take a little break in the shade and let her young nurse, and uh, I think they were nursing a little bit too hard or maybe their teeth were growing in because she gave them multiple snarls to tell them to ease off a little bit. Um, but it's a pretty neat moment to catch that expression. Now, one of the reasons that the, the lions of this part of Botswana are particularly cool is there's lots of drama going on right now between them. So this is Tukakama. Uh, he is the head of the marsh pride, that large pride of about 40 animals I mentioned. Um, and he is in kind of a dominance challenge with one of his kids, whose name is Sukoti, who leads up the North Pride in the Sibuti area. And this drama, um, which will probably come down in the next year or two to a full on battle, um, has drawn the interest of a lot of people in the Botswana public. And as a result, there are, uh, it's drawn uh, local tourists, which haven't really been a thing um, in Botswana. Um, until this drama started to occur. And um, as when we were there a month and a half ago, we were, we encountered a couple of vehicles, safari vehicles loaded with local people from Botswana or coming up from Gaborone, uh, who were coming out specifically to see this lion and his son Sukoti because they'd been reading the social media accounts that have been published about the drama between these two lions. And they wanted to see the lions for themselves. They even had t-shirts made up with their lions. One, one group we saw had a t-shirt that said Team Sukote with a picture of Sukote on it. And one had a, another one said Team Sakakama with pictures of this particular lion, um, which I think is, is pretty neat uh, to make sh that interest and that pride in the activities of the wildlife of the, of the country uh, become something that's important to the locals. So that was really neat to see this year. Um, this, on this particular day, uh, Tsukakama was hanging out with, uh, with uh, three or three, maybe even four Most of those of us just on the trip would have noticed them until one of the guides spotted these little cubs poking their heads up out of the out of the dead bush that was just above where Sakakama was sleeping. Uh, there's also a lot of other predators in this part of Botswana. Um, 
hyenas, which are abundant, they're all over the place, and you see tracks all the time, and you hear them overnight, um, but you rarely see them. And uh, they are almost entirely nocturnal. Um, so this is a, uh, seeing them is, is a bit of a treat. Um, this was a, one we encountered on my first journey to this area. And this was on the least, most recent trip. A pair of young ones playing with a stick, just like dogs, although they're not dogs, and nor are they cats. Uh, they fall into their own group. There are leopards in this area. Um, we worked hard to find leopards on the last trip and did get one brief sighting, but my previous trips, we've had pretty good luck um, encountering leopards along the journey. And they definitely are fairly, they're present, um, certainly in the, in the, all over in this part of the of Botswana, uh, but they're definitely in the uh, Sibuti area. Uh, Blackback jackals, um, pretty much just the African version of coyotes, as far as I can tell. And of course, the other creatures of Africa that we are familiar with, like giraffes. And just the silhouette of the giraffe head there. I kind of liked how that image came together in the end. Um, and in Sibuti, another one of the big draws is big bull elephants. Uh, the big bulls of this area are a quarter or a third again larger than the ones that are up along the Chobe River. Um, Chobe National Park as a whole has something like 60,000 elephants in it. Um, big numbers of elephants. Botswana has more elephants than any other country in the world. Um, but the, the big bulls tend to like this particular area. Um, on the most recent trip, though this area was still fairly dry, rains had arrived somewhere nearby. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the elephants had moved off to the natural water holes, um, but we did encounter a few. Um, in drier years, they're quite, they, they come into the water holes in, in, uh, in abundance in big groups. Um, the lions of both the North Pride and the Marsh Pride are some of the few lions to hunt elephants. Um, it's not a common behavior, it's very risky. Um, but they do do it. Um, like that little youngster there on the lower right, that's definitely uh, vulnerable to lions. And so the big herds of the females and males were keeping a close eye. And it's not hard to get close to them. Um, sometimes you want to be close to them. You get close to them whether you want to or not. Um, but usually it's it's no problem. The, the local guides that we work with know these animals very well, know their behavior well, um, and so can tell when you're when they've gotten too close or we've gotten too close or if it's not the right animal to approach. Um, they can tell just based on their behavior and how they look, um, whether or not that's a safe animal to get close by. And that's a big part of the reason we rely on the local expertise. All right. Um, and again, the same elephant just pulled back a little bit. This guy was, was quite close to our vehicle two years ago. Talking a little bit more about how you deal with bright lights. And sometimes I just pull back a little bit. You know, you, an up close portraiture and bright hot light may not look the best, but you pull back a little bit, you tell a little bit more of the environment and the story um, and even the weather in an image like this. Um, and it can become a more effective way to, uh, to tell that story. Um, and of course, birds, I'm always taking pictures of birds and looking at birds, birding, and watching birds, things with feathers, uh, to a point that I sometimes worry that I'm driving people nuts. Um, but this is a, a, a crested helmet shrike, white crested helmet shrike. Uh, this is a least bee eater, swallowtail bee eater, red crested coron, which is a, a bustard species. Arrow marked babbler, uh, two least bee eaters. Yellow billed hornbill, these guys are like gray jays. They are all over the place and they constantly come into camp to scavenge. Pretty flashy though. Uh, this is a um, lilac breasted roller over a back of an impala. And Lilac breasted roller. I could just show about a whole slideshow of lilac breasted rollers, and I doubt anybody would complain. Uh, they are seriously flashy birds, and but they're kind of they're surprisingly difficult to photograph. It's not that they're shy, and they're abundant. They're all over the place. You see a dozen or more a day, um, but getting them in good light when they're perched with a decent background um, is not easy. Um, in the hot, bright midday light, their colors get very muted. Um, and so finding this particular bird with a decent background and lovely warm evening light, oh man, I definitely took advantage of that this trip. 
So another brief interlude before we move into the Okavango Delta. I wanted to take a minute to talk about how these safaris work and the life on safari. Um, and so we stay in mobile camps on these trips. There are big canvas wall tents, you know, they're I don't know, 12 feet by 10 feet um, indoors with a porch and then a bathroom area in the back. Um, Botswana has notoriously expensive lodges in the neighborhood of $2,000 a night per person. Um, and so it can be really expensive to stay in lodges. Um, but it's not just about the price for me. Um, the camps are really nice. They are fully kitted out with real beds. Um, they, the bathroom areas behind are, uh, you know, have a pit toilet and a shower, a gravity shower that filled with hot water each evening when you get back from camp. Um, and there's campfires and the food's good. Uh, it's just a really pleasant way to be out. You can feel like you're camping without kind of really having to feel go through the hardship of camping um each of the each evening kerosene lanterns are lit on the porches of the tents to basically serve as night lights um and it can just be a, a you know they're beautiful to photograph um and they're really comfortable so this is a my tent from the most recent trip we come in each day after being out and the beds would be made with fresh linens and two pillows and a nice mattress and they always did crazy folding of the bath towels. Um, and so it was always just a, 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 a comfortable way uh, to come out into bush Africa. Um, and plenty of space, uh, you know, if you're a solo camper like I was, even for a double, there's still plenty of room for, for two people in these tents. And the food, uh, pretty exceptional. Um, the They have a separate kitchen tent that's screened in if you need it or open to the air if you want the breeze to come through. Um, and there's always beautiful soups at dinner and multiple, usually three courses for dinner, um, lunches or you know, a variety of things, cooked hot lunches when we're in camp or uh, picnic lunches when we're on a moving day. Um, and uh, rather exceptional food, tea time each day um, with uh, you know, often fresh baked cakes like on this particular day uh, that are done over a fire and fresh breads at each meal. So, uh, and abundant wines and gin and tonics and beers and both of the, the vehicles we use have refrigerators in them. So there's always cold drinks around which are a savior on hot days. Um, but anyway, it's just a, it's a really great way to experience it. Um, campfires at night are one of the highlights of the trips. I don't get too many complaints about this itinerary, um, but one of the few I do occasionally get is people wish they had more time to hang out around the campfire. Um, so it's just a, it's a pleasant way to experience being out. Um, socializing around the campfire is a highlight of the day. Um, you can share stories, swap experiences, um, and just simply kick back with the gin and tonic in front of the, uh, in front of the fire. Um, Early Kingfisher Safaris is the local company I use. Um, and um, they're a, a great local operator um, owned by my friend Sam, Sam Mopalo, um, and he's, he's putting together a great safari operation. These are the vehicles we use. Uh, they are converted Toyota Land Cruiser pickups, um, big four by four tires on them, tough as nails, uh, quite efficient uh, vehicles for this. Um, and I organize it so that everybody gets a window seat. Um, nobody's stuck in the middle. I want to make sure everybody's got room to see. Um, and so that's, that's, how we, that's how we work it. Um, there's Carl in the front left there of the, of the vehicle right here, um, taking photos of what I believe was a Eagle Owl, I believe, um, Barox's Eagle Owl. And uh, that's Paul, one of the local guides there hanging out in the front. Um, and each vehicle has a local driver. Um, and then I structure it. So if there's two vehicles, there's at least two professional photographers, one for each vehicle to help people uh, if they have any questions about photography along the way. There's not a lot of time outside of the vehicles. Um, so these are not walking safaris. Botswana does not generally permit walking. Um, and so most of the photography we do is from the vehicles. Um, so when we get an opportunity to be out on foot, we almost always take advantage of it. Uh, we take daily tea breaks and, and rest breaks along the way multiple times. Um, and often there's birds and other things hanging around. You're not allowed out of the car if there's wildlife nearby, um, at least not mammals, um, but birds of course are fair game. So here's, uh, there's Carl on the right, me, and a few of our clients snapping away at, I believe, which were some Carmen um, bee eaters. 
Uh, and the vehicles are also good for crossing the pretty rough terrain that we do throughout, uh, particularly uh, these bridges that are, let's just say they're artisanal bridges, um, definitely handmade constructions over the various channels of the Okabanga. The two local guides that we had this particular trip, that's Sam Mopalo on the left and his brother-in-law, Paul. Um, and these guys are the best. I just don't have a bad word to say about them. They're funny and they're friendly and they're they're wizards at spotting wildlife. Um, and uh, they are worth their weight in gold, as far as I can tell for leading these trips. All right, so let's dive into the Okavango. Uh, how am I doing on time? I think I'm doing all right. Um, and as you get into the Okavango, there's more water. And even outside of the flood season, there are a lot of remnant pools of water and there's river channels that come through. Um, and so things like hippopotamus are much more abundant in this area than they are certainly in Cebuti and in the more arid regions farther north. Um, they will appear basically in any water that you can find, even if that water is more soil than water. Um, and this was a group of 15 or 16 hippos we found uh, two years ago in just a heaping pile of mud. Um, I don't know why they were hanging out there when just a, a quarter mile away there was good water, but uh, they seemed, well, happy. Um, red lechwe, this is another uh, species of antelope, highly tied to water. You never find them very far away from water, um, but they are very common throughout the Okavango. Um, and also just the water provides a level of texture to the landscape um, that you don't get in these more arid regions. So there's, you just get the sense of diversity as you're making this journey uh, through northern Botswana. It's a, a darter there in silhouette. Lots of other birds, water birds that are, you know, definitely um, water dependent species like this African jacana, uh, great egret, same species we have in North America actually. Uh, white-faced whistling ducks, uh, African stilt, striated heron, all of these species are ones that you don't generally encounter outside of the Okavango. Uh, Saddle-billed stork, this bird's a knockout, such a beauty. And kingfishers, this is a, a woodland kingfisher uh, photographed from the front. And the same species photographed from the back, and boy, they are flashy. Pied kingfisher, malachite kingfisher. These guys are tiny, about the size of a white crowned sparrow. But flashy as can be, and a real pleasure to see. Um, and two, because of the water, there's just a lot of wildlife. In the Okavango, you are rarely out of sight of one species of large mammal or another. Um, and that's true for much of the trip. Um, but the photographic experience also shows that as well. As, uh, uh, you know, as you can see there, you, it's, you constantly have the camera up um, and it's hard to make a decision. Do we leave these elephants because there might be something further along or do we stay here? Um, it's the kind of fun decisions to make. This was a, a hot day in the Okavango a couple of years ago, and this very young um, calf elephant was hanging out with its mom, and uh, she was they were standing right between its front legs, so she so the, the calf could be in the shade of its mother. I thought that was a rather a touching scene on a hot day. Now, this is an animal that is not common <clears throat> in this part of Botswana. Um, so this is a cheetah. Uh, they are quite rare in the Okavango. Um, and else, even elsewhere, um, particularly in this area. They do occur in the Cebuti area. They do occur, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Okavango, but finding them can be exceedingly difficult. Um, we did find one two years ago. Paul, one of the guides who led us this year, uh, spotted these guys for us um, two years ago, and it was a highlight of the trip. It was two brothers hanging out in the shade after a kill, and uh, um, it was a remarkable thing to see. Definitely not one to count on. If you want to see cheetahs in Botswana, you go to the Kalahari. Uh, you don't necessarily go to, uh, to the Okavango, uh, but if you luck out, you can get them there too. Lions, Boy, this most recent trip, we may have had a hard time finding leopards, but we had lions 
every single day except the very first full day of the trip um there are were lions we couldn't we couldn't throw a rock without hitting a lion it felt like this most recent trip spent a lot of time with lions um, including this big male in the Kwai area of the okabongo watching a lion wake up is a little like you know I remember being a teenager and just trying to get myself up out of bed. And that's a little what it feels like to watch a lion wake up from its midday nap um, as the evening comes on. Um, so these are just a couple of photos of this, this particular male lion trying to get himself to wake up to go hunting for the evening. And I think eventually he managed to get himself up. When they're first rising, the lions from their midday nap, it's a great time to watch them because they're active, they're starting to become alert, they stop and take drinks of little roadside puddles like this lioness did, um, and can make quite, um, you know, they, they start to become active and alert. Um, it's a lot more interesting to watch than just a sleeping lion. Um, same thing first thing in the morning. This was a pride we encountered on our final morning of the most recent trip, and they had made a, a kill in the night that apparently was pretty messy because they were these lions were covered in blood, and they had not yet uh, cleaned themselves off, and so the flies were coming in all around them. And when this uh, this lioness yawned, um, the flies just took off from her face. And I think I would have taken a moment to clean if I was putting up with that. Uh, this. Uh, older cub uh, was just matted with blood on his, on his fur. Um, the uh, local guides told us that they'd likely taken a small prey item, um, which they don't take the time to gently kill by suffocation um, and just tend to eat them while they're still kicking. Um, and as a result, that uh, throws a lot of blood around and can coat the lions in, uh, in uh, messy, matted, dried blood. Pleasant. Um, this is a dwarf mongoose. There's a like five or six species of mongoose, um, and we see most of them over the course of the trip. Um, and they're actually pretty neat. They're you know they're a, a species of weasel, um, and they're quite photogenic. I believe this is slender mongoose. I think slender mongoose. Leopards again. Uh, this was a wonderful encounter a couple of years ago. Uh, this leopard was uh, when it, when the guides first got to know her uh, him. Um, he was known as Blue Eyes. Um, you can see his eyes are somewhat blue. Um, but after a period of time, um, he, they changed his name because he'd been attacked by lions and lost his one of his rear legs in a fight with the lions. Um, and so he was called Tripod after that. Um, he was seven years old when I made this image, and he lived until he was eight and a half before uh, he finally succumbed to time and uh, depredation. Um, Kudu. Uh, this is a, definitely a species, an antelope, one of the larger antelope species. They are a species of brush, despite their size. They're probably equivalent about the size of an elk, um, something like that. Um, it's a female on the left and a male on the right. Marshall eagle, definitely one of my favorite species of birds. Look at the size of those feet. Uh, these guys are eaters of baboons and monkeys and young impala. They are powerful. Um, telling the story of the animals photographically is a, a constant challenge and a constant joy uh, for me. And so this particular image was made after the two year drought that you guys may have heard a bit about. Um, there hadn't been substantial rain in this part of Botswana for almost two solid years. Um, and the trip I was leading two years ago came right as that drought was breaking. Um, and so the Virga falling out of the clouds in the background with the rather dry soils in the foreground, um, but that early green rain, I think tells a story. Um, and that's something I always look for when I'm out photographing um, anywhere, but in Botswana in particular. Lots of giraffes in this part of the Okavango, as they are over most of our journey. And my favorites, African painted dogs, probably one of the least known predators to um, anybody who's not from this part of Africa. Um, they're highly endangered. Um, there's probably only 6,000 or so left in the world. Um, but there are, but the, the Okavango and Northern Botswana is one of their strongholds. And I get jittery with excitement bouncing up and down whenever we find these guys. Um, and we did find them on this most recent trip several times. And it was a very special experience. We caught them um, one particular evening right as they were getting ready to head out to hunt. Um, these guys are not 
uh, they when they hunt, they don't mess around with stalking or with uh, you know trying to sneak in close. They just run. They put their heads down and their ears back and they just run. Um, and they they may not be as fast as Impala on a hundred yard dash, but they can run them down because these guys can run full out for seven minutes. Um, and there's no other animal that can do that. And as a result, wild dogs have the highest success rate of any predator in Africa with close to 80% success. Um, in other words, 80% of the times they head out to catch something, they catch something. Um, but seeing that kill is hard because it often happens a long way from where the hunt started. However, this particular trip, we came up on them as they were finishing up their kills on a couple of occasions. Um, uh, this one, the, uh, as the, the dregs of the young antelope were, um, were there, the, the, the skin and the head tends to become a chew toy. Um, and as a result, the, uh, the younger dogs uh, spend a lot of time just playing with the remains of the kill. Um, here they are heading out uh, for the first of their evening hunts. These guys are almost entirely um, crepuscular, meaning they like the early morning hours and the late evening hours, and they sleep during the day and they sleep at night. Um, and yet during those hours, they can catch multiple uh, antelope. We encountered some um, a small pack of dogs uh, for deeper in the Okavango than where this image was taking on the recent trip. And they had killed, they killed twice in about 15 minutes. But of course it's hot work. And so finding a good puddle like any good dog uh, is an important thing to do to cool off. Um, two years ago, we came on a, a pack of dogs in deep in the Okavango uh, just after they'd made a kill um, and it was raining and it just made just a, a beautiful moment to create photos of, of wild dogs. So I just have a few from that series here. And as I mentioned, the, the heads of the impalas tend to become chew toys for the young pups. But the, we're not the only ones who know that uh, the wild dogs are effective killers and scavengers and other predators also know this. And so when the dogs are on the hunt, lions and hyenas are not far behind. Uh, this was a, a late in the evening, boy, it was just, I had to crank up my ISO to make this shot. Um, you can tell it's quite noisy, um, but this was just after the, the dogs had made a kill um, just a short distance away, and I think he could smell that kill on the wind and was on his way. Uh, two lions were also doing the same. But those, all this, those dregs of the kills of lions and the kills of hyenas and kills by all the predators uh, become food for all of the scavengers, like this juvenile white-backed vulture, which we found perched next to the skull of a Cape buffalo. Um, so that's kind of the end of our the general safari itinerary, but I did want to briefly mention the Kalahari. Um, so of my trips to Botswana, I have done one brief excursion to the Kalahari of about three days. Um, and I want to make a note that it's definitely worth seeing. Um, it's quite different. The Like I said, the, the habitat feels similar to what you have in Savuti, but you get species that don't occur elsewhere. So this is an oryx, um, perhaps one of the flashier species of antelope um, with that beautiful clown-like makeup um, on the face. Um, and springboks are another species of antelope which don't generally occur elsewhere um, outside of the Kalahari. There's other species that are more typical, um, although the giraffes there tend to be a bit paler in color. Uh, the lions of the Kalahari are different. They have a black mane, uh, which really makes them stand out. And as I mentioned, their cheetahs uh, are much more abundant in the Kalahari. Um, kudu uh, are still quite present in the Kalahari. Um, and there's a number of bird species, if you're a birder or interested in bird photography, uh, that don't really occur too much outside of that area. This is a, a, a white-browed sparrow weaver. Um, we talked about these guys before, they're everywhere. Uh, but this, I thought that was a nice photo with this guy with a nice wasp, yellow-billed hornbill. Um, and then uh, some of the species of the kind of almost cats. Um, this is a small spotted genet. Um, and uh, they're a, you know, an arboreal, they're not really a raccoon, they're not really a cat, they're definitely not a dog, they're not really a weasel, kind of their own thing. Um, so that's it. I wanna say thanks for listening um, and for your attention. Um, I do want to mention that Carl and I are collaborating on a trip to this same area 
from 24 April to 7 May 2023. We literally just set the dates yesterday uh, for this trip. Um, we're both really excited about it. It's gonna be a different time of year uh, from these trips. This will be, we're gonna be concentrating a lot of time in Sibuti and in um, the Mababe Depression area of Chobe National Park. The big herds of zebras should be on the move northward out of the Kalahari into Chobe during this time of year. Um, if you wanna learn more, that's my website right there. Um, I'm happy to pass that around or touch base with either Carl or I. Uh, we are just now starting to accept signups for the trip. Um, so please uh, get in touch if you're interested in coming. It's gonna be a awesome journey. Um, so I am happy to take any questions that you may have. I'm also gonna invite Carl to uh, step in as well and share his thoughts um, whenever uh, he feels he would like to. Uh, so I'm gonna stop the screen share here and jump back to Zoom. All right. Before Anybody I, have questions? Before I chime in, I'll, I'll wait for some questions. Do you great want to present, a great presentation, David? Choices? Uh, thanks so much. Glad, to, glad you guys enjoyed it. Um, yeah, happy to happy to talk gear, happy to talk logistics, anything about wildlife, whatever you want to, whatever you want. There was just a question about lens choices there, David. Oh yeah, what kind of camera are you using? Um, so I'm shooting with Canon's uh, new R5 mirrorless system um, and lenses that I take on this trip. Uh, I tip, I'd say just about every image you saw there was either taken with a 600 millimeter f4 um, or a 70 to 200 f2.8. Thanks, Stephanie. And I'll, nice. I'll, I'll add that uh, my primary lens I used was my 200 to 400, uh, occasionally with a 1.4 on it. But I had a second body with a 7200 that was quite handy frequently for things that do get close or too big, you know, to get with the longer lens. Especially when you dropped your 200 to 400. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> get off to Nikon tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> I'm glad you had a backup lens for that, Carl. I felt really bad. That kind of a trip, you always want a backup camera and lens or two. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if you have to rent, I mean, by all means, rent gear for these kinds of things. There's, there's no reason to buy a $10,000 lens for a, for a two week trip. Just, just rent something. Um, yep. and then, uh, and, and have a backup because you never know. Yep. So Dave was, uh, dust a problem at all in any of the safaris there for like changing lenses and everything? You know, so generally the answer is no. Um, they, unlike East Africa, where you'll be on high speed dirt roads with lots of dust flying. Almost all of the driving in Botswana happens on sandy two track roads, Jeep roads basically. Um, and you're not going fast enough to kick up dust. And so at least not a lot. I mean, you still take care. It's not like you're you know, gonna swap lenses during the fast driving sections of the road anyway, or when there's a vehicle in front of you. Um, you know, because we have two vehicles, occasionally there's a little dust kicked up by the vehicle in front. Um, but in general, no, uh, the dust is not too big of a deal here. How bad are the uh, bugs? Uh, How bad are the bugs? Good question. Um, and honestly, not bad at all. Uh, Carl, did you even see a mosquito the last trip? You know, I thought I heard one once, but then I later heard it again and I confirmed it was a it sounded a lot like a mosquito, but it was not a mosquito. Um, yeah. You know, I never put on bug dope or my uh, mosquito head netting at all during this trip. There were some flies like in the evening that bothered other people. But, you know, when you're from Alaska, they weren't really enough to bother with bug dope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like along the Chobe Riverfront, um, there tend to be some flies at the camp first thing in the morning. Um, nothing that's a big deal may go away as soon as the day starts to warm up. But no, in general, the bugs aren't bad. Um, just about everybody takes malaria medication. But honestly, I don't know if I'm going to bother next time. Um, it kind of makes you feel oogie. And, and you, you, we didn't see a mosquito. I didn't swat one. I didn't see one. I think one person reported getting a mosquito bite. 
So Dave, out of all the birds you watched and photographed, uh, I know you love the roller, like I guess everybody does. Is there one favorite bird that you really, above all else? Marshall Eagle. Yep, Marshall Eagle, definitely. That's a spectacular bird. Um, and that photo I have was, it was a, a highlight moment from that particular trip. Um, we did see the Marshall Eagle again this most recent trip. So we, we see them most trips, but they are, they're a knockout. I mean, it's like a golden eagle, except a third bigger and feet that are twice the size. And they're just mega powerful, super cool. Yeah. There's tons of raptors. There's so many eagle species. And there's like 12 eagle species. Um, and so that's just the raptors are worth going for. Actually, I, I think I looked in the Birds of Botswana book and the index, and there's 17 eagle species listed. 17 <laughs> eagles, there you go. Wow. Yep. It's oh, insane. Yep. I don't know if you're checking the chat, but there's lots of com positive comments over there from people. Yeah, thanks, folks. Oh, yeah, I see somebody was up in, was in Namibia just across. Namibia is on my list, Colin. Uh, that's one of the places I've wanted to go, and I'll, I'll probably try to make an extension there at uh, and one of my next couple of trips to go check out the areas there. Is most of your travel uh, in Botswana uh, by land then? Very yeah, little yeah. Uh, yeah, we've done fly. Um, some trips I've done have involved a little bit of flying, um, but it gets expensive when you're, when you're a photographer um, because they charge through the nose if you go over about 15 kilos of gear, and that includes your clothes. Um, and so I carry 15 kilos practically just of camera gear. Um, and so we basically have to pay double price for all the seats that we do, and it just gets really expensive really fast yeah. if you fly. How, how um, much of your travel is on boat? Uh, not very much. Uh, so we do the the first afternoon um, on this particular itinerary on boats. And then usually most trips we do a, um, a Makoro, which are pole-driven canoe trips up in the Okavango. Um, which is really fun but this particular most recent trip there wasn't enough water and so they uh, the the only the only water in the river was right in the deepest channel and that's where the hippos hang out and so they can't go paddling past hippos so we missed that this time unfortunately david could you highlight the number of um and maybe either average or from the most recent trip the number of bird species and the number of mammal species we encountered during the 12 days so on the trip that we just did carl um i counted 178 species of birds um and that was just me um so the group as a whole i think got, got just over 200 um and in terms of mammals i haven't compiled the mammal list but it's on my it's on my to-do list for this week i guess it's in the neighborhood of 35 or 40 mammal species I, I, pretty exceptional I think, biodiversity. I think the, the two things I want to share is my reflections of the things that really stood out for me. Actually, three things. Um, one thing you need to add to your, your slideshow are the termite mounds. Yeah, <laughs> because I did, I did that. Yeah, that was the thing that really tripped me out the most. It was an unexpected, really, really super cool thing about being in Botswana was the termite mounds. The termite ecology was really fascinating. The, the diversity, I, I saw more wildlife in 12 days than I'd seen living in Alaska for 22 years. It's just amazing. I've, I've always kind of dismissed going to Africa for wildlife because yeah, there's plenty of wildlife here, but no, there's, there's just no comparison at all. I was, it, it's, it's like that opening scene from Jurassic Park when they're out in that field and there's like 50 different species of animals and birds within sight from where you're at. And that just kind of blew my mind. And the third thing I want to just emphasize is the, the camp experience. Um, you know, David highlighted the, the kind of the accommodations, but he, he didn't cover the fact there are nine staff who are there to meet our needs. Uh, two of them are guides and the other seven are the chef and the housekeeping and the logistics people. So part of the deal of that campfire experience that's so freaking awesome when you get back from a long day, like 12 hour day of, of game driving, is you sit down at a campfire, you're not there for a minute sitting in that chair when somebody comes up to you and says, what would you like to drink? And I just, I developed an, an entirely new appreciation for gin and tonics on this trip <laughs> uh, compared to my previous experiences. 
Yeah, One more second technical. that the uh, the amount of work that goes into the camps. I mean, w- we were ten people um, or ten, you know, Carl and I plus eight clients, and there were nine staff taking care of us. Um, and it's just a, they do such a remarkable operation. It's yeah, uh, you, you just you're just blown away by the quality of the experience. One more technical question, David. Uh, sure. For your black and white images. What uh, what's your process on those black and white? You do it just all in Photoshop, or do you use other uh, programs as well? Uh, Lightroom is my go-to. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, I rarely use Photoshop, honestly. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of Photoshop. It's I use it for some very specific things, uh, but I bet 99% of my post-processing is post-processing is out of Lightroom. Um, so yeah, and I tend not to use the the stock conversions. I tend to just adjust things. I, I, I drop the saturation and then take it from there um, and do a lot of modifications with contrast and the lights and darks. Cool, thank you. One more thing to add real quick too about the guides. Um, not only are they great wildlife spotters, but, and this is how I got into the termite mound ecology, they will frequently stop during our game drive days and point out things of, of natural history. Um, how you can tell what type of animal is marking the trees, elephants marking here um, and other species marking, the termite mounds, uh, different parts of the way the, the, the different wildlife live in the landscape, how the landscape changes, how the rivers change. And it's just, an, you really do need to have a good, um, a field note journal to take with, because there's just so much information you learn from these guides. Um, and their, their knowledge, their breadth of experiences. I mean, the two guides had over 40 years of experience between them. So it was really amazing the amount of information they had, local knowledge that they were sharing with us during the trip. Yeah, with all the knowledge David shared, I would imagine he was uh, taking some good notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, going back again and again helps a lot. Yeah. A quick question for you regarding how you're charging your batteries in the field. Good question. I meant to mention that during the course of the talk. Um, so each of the vehicles have a power strip put in them. Um, and so they just charge off the batteries. Same thing that runs the refrigerators that are in the vehicles. Um, and so you just have to have the converter that goes to the South African and Botswana style plug. And you can charge anything you need from laptops to camera batteries to whatever. Uh, there's not charging in your tents. I carry a little backup battery so I can charge you know, my phone or iPad or whatever in my tent if I need it. Um, but any big charging things happen in the vehicles. It's pretty straightforward. You never run out of power as long as you're careful. Uh, let's see, somebody asked about file backup storage, battery backup processing in the field. Uh, you know, that's a kind of a real personal sort of thing. Um, for the first time on this most recent trip, I actually God, I feel like I'm a terrible person for saying it, but I didn't back up. Um, I just left stuff on my SD cards, put them carefully away, um, and um, and got lucky. Um, previous trips, I have taken laptops. I have taken um, with external drives. I've uh, taken just an iPad Pro um, and then backed up key images to the iPad Pro or to a um, or to an and to an external hard drive. Um, and I don't do much processing in the field. Honestly, there's not a lot of time. Um, so you're getting up every day at 4:30 in the morning uh, before dawn. You have a quick breakfast, um, and then as soon as it's light enough for them to legally hit the road, you go out. And so you're out out watching critters the minute the sun is coming up. Um, and then you're out pretty much all day. Um, on days when you're at a layover camp, you might come back about you know 11, you have two or three, four hours to hang out in camp. So I suppose there's a little time there, but usually just too tired. And so you just kind of hang out, chat, play cards, you know, do whatever you want. Um, and so, and then you're back out again in the evening and on transfer transfer days between camps, um, it's basically an all day game drive. And so you're getting up at 4.30 and you're not gonna get back into camp until dinner time. Um, and so it's just not a lot of time to deal with any kind of processing in the field. However, having a plan for some sort of backup um, is probably pretty important if you're not lazy like me. All 
looking for any other questions in the chat. I'm not seeing anything, but um, I dropped my email address into the chat there. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, about this or just, you know, general photo questions. Um, I'm more than happy to, to talk photography with people. So uh, yeah, feel free to touch base if you've got anything. And the chat will be available on the uh, website once the video is posted, so. I see Tom asking how many cards in the R5. You know, um, I think I probably had a terabyte and a half of cards with me, which was way more than I needed. Um, I think I shot about 8,000 images on the most recent trip. Um, and that's varied from anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 um, on the trips I've done. Um, and uh, I'm shooting in raw, Canon's raw files. Um, but the, uh, I think I used about five cards, five, uh, two fifty six gig cards, um, on this recent trip. Um, so yeah, something like that. Well, awesome questions, everybody. Yeah. And thank you, David, for filling in. This oh, was great too. presentation. Love that. Anytime. Thank you. Put one more question out. Yeah, go ahead. Are you using just plain raw or are there cannons, they're compressed raw? Uh, no, I use the full raw. Yeah, I don't mess around with any of the compressed files and file formats. So it's the Canon CR3, and then I convert that immediately to a DNG when it goes into Lightroom. Roger that. Well, great presentation, David. Thank you. Yeah, you are more than welcome. Um, yeah, um, I will. Uh, it sounds like you guys have some uh, some business to take care of, so I'll probably uh, to click out here. Um, it's also about 10 p.m. here, so it's bedtime for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks so much for having me, everybody. Again, feel free to touch base if you have any questions. Um, and I'm, I'm no, no, Carl and I would love to talk to anybody who'd like to go to Botswana with us in 2023.